name is Stacy Croft. I've known Stacy for about nine or ten years. Uh, he did uh, youth ministry stops in Houston and in Dallas, and then uh, went to seminary in Jackson and has been the campus minister at RUF at Vanderbilt University for the last nine years. Um, I remember when I first met Stacy, I was on the committee that interviewed him, and uh, he was filling big shoes at Vanderbilt. And uh, I can say that as we've looked back over his ministry over the last nine years, God has used him in a tremendous way in the lives of not only countless students, but faculty alike. And I'm just so grateful that we have Stacy at RUF at Vanderbilt. He has a wife, Megan, and a beautiful son named Jake, and we are thrilled that he is at RYM Junior High, Florida. Will you join me in welcoming Stacy Croft as our main speaker? Well, that was... Uh... Thank you very much. That was um, very kind, Joey. Joey's known me <laughs> through a lot of things. And many of you are probably going, Stacy Croft, and expected a woman to walk up here because I do have a girl's name, yes, and I have an afro. But um, <laughs> and I get that a lot. And it's, uh, it's really wonderful for me to be here with you for a lot of reasons. Uh, one is, it's an, I just want to thank you. Uh, it's an honor for me for years in, at Christ the King Prez in Houston, at Park City's Prez in Dallas, uh, where I grew up. I was a youth uh, minister, youth director, and um, so RYM and, and youth ministry are very dear to my heart, and it's an honor to be here with you. And also, uh, you may not even know this, these guys that are playing uh, were my students. They just graduated, one of them uh, just graduated a year ago, and that, yeah, they, uh, they used to play music for us. And, uh, a couple of these guys, uh, they, they're all from Nash Vegas, uh, Nashville, Tennessee, we call it Nash Vegas. Um, but, uh, but I'm very glad they're here. So this is like, this is totally like home for me, you know. I'm sure something's got to go wrong for us to, this to be really right. But, um, but thanks for having me here. Um, I, uh, yeah, I've been at Vanderbilt for, uh, I'm going into my, I'm in my ninth year. And it's amazing. It goes by so quickly. And I was just in this room like a month ago because we have RUF summer conference here as well. And uh, so it's funny to be back in the promised land twice. Can you do that? I don't know if you can do that. Uh, but uh, I'm so glad to be here. But let, let's get this out of the way now. Okay, who saw it? The guy who walked across the Grand Canyon last night on a tightrope. Did you hear about this dude? Okay. Last night, millions of people, millions, this is not like me doing a commercial. We're talking like millions and millions and millions of people watched this guy, Nick Walinda, walk across a tightrope across the Grand Canyon. It was a, 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 about a quarter of a mile long, and he was up 1,500 feet in the air. Um, crazy stuff. It, it, it took him 23 minutes to do this. And a couple times, like, he had to sit down on the thing because the wind was blowing it, and he wasn't even prepared for something. He'd been training. Like, they, they took him and put, like, this airboat, you know, that blows wind out the back and next to him while he was walking, like, over mats to practice. Still, it's still wasn't like the same conditions. The, 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 uh, the cable was all dusty. I mean, he, you could see him. He was physically distressed as he was walking. I mean, can you imagine? Why would you be? Now, here's what I love. Um, there were two things. There was a 10-second delay in case the dude fell. So millions of people could watch this man plummet to his death in the Grand Canyon. That sounds like great television. And then, not just that, but they had a paramedic on scene. Now what is that guy going to do? <laughs> like what, what's he, are you going to put a band-aid on the guy? I mean it, you, 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 he falls 1500 feet, good luck. He's just going to wave at him? Like is that what he's there to do? So I mean this is what it was. But here's what was so fascinating about it y'all. As millions of people watched it, 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 caused, it, it created a huge stir. And it wasn't just because he walked across. But as he was doing it, as he was walking across all 23 minutes or so, he was praying. Now, if you haven't seen it, you need to go back and watch it. I'm telling you, it's all over the place. It, it, he's praying the whole time. And very interestingly, walking across, asking the Lord whether he was saying, uh, thank you, Lord, for this beautiful creation, or um, asking the Lord to stop the 
wind or just saying God and just invoking Jesus' name as he walked across in prayer. Now, it was interesting because what it did was it stirred a lot of buzz in, in cyberspace. Uh, Twitter, the Twitter feed that they had for it, drew up a lot of things. And, and listen to what people were saying about it. One follower said this. This could be a public relations nightmare for Jesus if this thing goes wrong. That's what one person said. Another person said this about it. Barely even opened my French book for this exam. Praise you, Jesus. You are my Savior, Jesus. Take control over these exams tomorrow. Good luck with that. Um, another one is was this, and, and you can see just the spectrum of what people said. This is proof that God is capable of awesome things. You can't tell me that God wasn't watching over him. Now, look, I, as my wife and I watched it, and our necks, my neck is still stiff from watching this guy like this. You watch, and, and I, I don't, it was both a beautiful and crazy thing. Beautiful in the fact that in his deepest fear, he is praying. But crazy in the fact of, is that faith mixed with doubt? Now here's a question for you. What did, what if... What if he plummeted to his death on live television? Would that prove his faith useless and any doubt that we read in cyberspace about God and who he is worthless as well? If he didn't make it across, would that render faith useless and doubt be the winner? I think it's a very fascinating thing to ask because as you even see, it comes out in a million ways. See, and you know it to be true. <laughs> you know, one minute you seem as though your life is working beautifully. Things are working out well. And then the next, doubt creeps in. It could be spiritual doubt. It could be uh, academic doubt. It could be doubt in your family, friendships, all these insecurities. And it shakes you in a way that you wonder... Not just, am I okay, but is this Christian thing a reality? I mean, think about it. It, it. Many of you are here this week, right? You're here, and some of you are wondering if you're going to be able to fit into the group you came with. Some of you came on this trip feeling as though you're on the outside of a circle of people in your youth group already that you're wanting to break into and you have all sorts of doubt of whether you're going to be, make it or not. Some of you are here scared to death about what it's going to be like to be on the beach, whether today you've already been there, and wear a bathing suit. Some of you have doubts already here. You're glad you're here and you do not want to go home when Friday hits. You're scared about what is already happening at home. Some of you are doubting all sorts of things. Your friendships, your family. Some of you, your parents just got divorced. And all of those doubts directly link to your questions, your doubts about God. Because, hey... If I see this happening in my life, then is God real? Is this whole Bible thing ridiculous? Can I trust what He says to me? If I'm going through this, if I feel these things, you all I know are living in a, a, a world of insecurity and doubt. They're floating through your head right now. And you know what? The adults in this room have just worked at getting better at it. They have the same doubts you do. So do I. We just try and mask them better. And that's what we're going to be talking about this week. How does faith relate to doubt? How do those things play into one another? The one question that we want to talk about specifically tonight, though, is... How is the relationship of faith and doubt... What is, what is that relationship... Because if you're walking along that wire of life and you fall, is God still God? And is your faith still real? So tonight we're going to look at two things from this passage I'm going to read. We're going to look at having doubt and having faith. That's it. Having doubt and having faith. So we're going to look at Mark chapter 9. We're going to look at... <clears throat> Verses 14 to 29. Mark chapter 9, 14 to 29. And I want you to, first of all, feel encouraged. Because I, I work at a campus that uh, 
not as just, a lot of people in this room may think of it as just a highly academic campus, and some of these guys over here can attest, but it's not just that. It's a place where, I, and what I love about what I do in RUF, is inviting students to ask questions, to bring your doubt. Let's engage it. And I want you to do that this week. I actually challenged every one of your leaders already in a, in a meeting earlier. For them to be safe places for you to engage faith and doubt this week. Engage the gospel. And that's what it means. This should be a safe place for you. And if you don't even know where Mark is in your Bible, I'm so glad you're here. That makes me excited. I love that. Because that's what we've got to learn. We've got to ask things. So let's read from Mark chapter 9, verses 14 to 29. And when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them, and the scribes arguing with them. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, were greatly amazed and ran up to him, greeted him. And he asked them, What are you arguing about with them? And someone from the crowd answered him, Teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able. And he answered him, He is Jesus. O oh, faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him. And when the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy, and he fell to the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked the father, How long has this been happening to him? And he said, From childhood. And it has often cast him into the fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, If you can, all things are possible for one who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said something so beautiful. I believe. Help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that crowd, saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter in him again. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out and the boy was like a corpse. So most of them said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up and he arose. And when he had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, This kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. I just want to look at two simple things tonight. Having doubt and having faith. First, let's talk about having doubt. I think from this passage, and if you have ever heard other passages in the Bible, I want to first encourage you that the Bible in, says your doubts are invited. The, the Bible is not a book to rebuke you simply on you having doubt. If you are a leader in here, or if you're in a group or lead a small group of any kind, even if you're a student encouraging people the gospel if you didn't have doubt what would you need the gospel for look there's even the, 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 the crux of this entire passage is fascinating because it revolves around a boy that can, it, it, the question is is he going to be healed the father is wondering is this boy is my son who has dealt with this since childhood going to be healed there are even arguments that break out over it because the disciples are arguing the scribes and, and there's just this pandemonium is this boy going to be healed is it going to happen <laughs> And it paints a picture to us that not just the Father, but the disciples need to bring their doubt, need to bring their questions of, how does this happen? How does this world change to God? The, book, the Bible is inviting. Look, doubt sometimes feels like it crashes our party, right? <laughs> doubt sometimes feels, when, when insecurity and doubt creep into our lives, whether it's by faith, uh, by, in spiritual things, or in familial things, whatever it is, it feels like it crashes the party that we're having. We feel so confident, so great, and then it comes in and ruins it all. But what the Bible is saying is that what it should do is when it creeps in is bring you closer to Jesus. It should push you to Him. I remember we were in Nashville and my wife and, and two other friends and I were uh, at a famous hotel in Nashville uh, enjoying an evening dessert. 
And, um, and we were sitting there, we heard this music, and there was a, a wedding reception going on in this hotel. And the song comes on that is one of my wife's favorites. It was Barry White, my first, my last, my everything. And she starts kind of hearing it, kind of feeling the music. She's like, I just got to go. So she gets up and walks off and walks through these doors, and we're kind of like, where did she go? And this is one of the reasons I, I married this woman, because she's so fantastic. But I walk over to the doors, I open them up, and there are all these guests in the party just sitting around. I look down the, the way from the door, and there is the bride, the little flower children, and my wife just doing this on the dance floor. Like they're just partying. She totally crashed a wedding. She's like in jeans and a nice top, and the, the bride's swishing her dress around. And everyone else is just kind of watching. And what I loved about that is such a picture of the gospel. It's, it's that God is saying to you and to me, he didn't he throw a bunch of answers to you. What is different about the Bible than any other religion is the fact that when you have doubt, when you have questions, God doesn't just throw answers. He sends his son. There's a person involved here. Jesus comes. He crashes. He doesn't wait for us to get it. He comes and does it. And, and, and doubts are interesting because don't they make you feel unprotected? When you have a doubt, you feel so insecure. You feel unsafe. But what is the gospel about? It's about a person coming to bring you into safety. Like our doubts are not only invited, but they're understood. L look how Jesus applies this to these two kind of parties here. But first, the disciples. And if you read this, it's really interesting. Because at first you're like, whoa, that's harsh. <laughs> and he is being harsh. Verse 19, O oh, faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? He's saying that to the disciples. He's showing his disappointment to the disciples. But what he's doing is, is not just saying, God, guys, you just, you're terrible. Why do I have to put up with you? He's not just saying that. Jesus doesn't just say things just to say them. What he's getting at here is deeper than their failure to heal the boy. It's something, when he uses the word, oh, faithless generation, he's saying, there's something that you're missing. Because what doubt often does, as Jesus is bringing truth to their issue, is that doubt forces us to think that we can handle it ourselves. That we have the ability to do it. He's correcting and rebuking the disciples because they think they have the ability and achievement to heal this boy. In fact, that's part of the argument they're having with the scribes more than likely. Is how is this to be done? You can even see at the very end of this, when they ask him privately, when they pull him aside and say, Jesus, what are we supposed to do here? And he says, you need, this spirit should be driven out by prayer. Prayer is not an achievement. It's not an ability. It's a direction. Jesus is bringing truth to their doubts and rebuking them. And some of you, like me, are very good at covering your doubts or using things in your life, your ability, your achievement, whether it's athletic, whether it's academic. Some of you are in places of spiritual position and you use even that to cover your doubts, to hide your questions. To, in other words, substitute faith for your spiritual ability. That's what Jesus is rebuking them for. He's not saying, you're terrible at healing people. He's saying, you are substituting faith, faithless. You are substituting the real faith here for your ability. And some of you in this room are, think you're being, even by being on a trip like this, think you're being spiritual and you may be hiding from God just by being here. My, my, my students can attest to this. Sometimes I tell them, uh, we have a leadership team of about 35 students, and I will tell them often, the greatest places to hide from God are on spiritual leadership positions because we substitute our ability for real faith in order to solve our doubts. But when here's how you know. Here's how you know you're substituting your ability, that if it runs out if you hit a wall, if you fall off the wire, then you're left going, wait, 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 what do I know is true? 
When your legs are really knocked out from them, you, I remember I was growing up, athletics were huge in my family. When I was born, my dad sent two letters. One to the head coach of the Dallas Cowboys and one to the head coach of the Texas Longhorns. And they both wrote back. And I have them framed in my office. And it's a really cool thing, but I, 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 it, it, it's a really good reminder to me that growing up, I really remember using sports as something that gave me ability that I could hide behind. And I would connect to other people. But when I saw that being taken out from under me, where is my faith? Was I really trusting in God or was I looking to Him for what He could give me? My ability, getting accolades from these things. That's what He's rebuking him for. But here's what's beautiful. That this man, when he turns to this man who... With, think about this. He has a son who is deaf and mute. He already has seizures that, from the Spirit that casts him into the fire. But to try and even comfort him, think about this father for a minute. Think about his desperation. I mean, he says to Jesus, and he knows who he is, Jesus, if you can do this. Because his doubts have not only, it's not just about ability, it's, it's taken away joy, it's taken away any hope. Some of you know that. Some of you feel that. Some of you are here this week feeling that. You're thinking, is this Christianity thing a real thing to me? Is faith something I, I just am a part of? Maybe you're here and you're not a Christian. You're saying this community is great. The, the, maybe the songs are great. Maybe the things we're going to do this week are great. But how does this really apply to the, the places in me where I really, I'm really struggling? I'm really hurting. It's amazing that Jesus steps into this man's life. And he even, so much so, takes the time to ask him, how long has this been happening to him? But Jesus didn't have to ask that. You know, sometimes in the Bible we have these details, by the way. They're really interesting. You know why they're there? It's because these are actual accounts. Someone's there. Mark taking this from Peter, listening to this, watching this interaction between this man who can't even comfort his own son from his seizures, his wounds, because he can't hear him and he can't communicate back. And Jesus says, how long has he been like this? He steps into this relationship. He not only brings truth to the doubts, but he brings grace. So what is what's having doubt? What does this have to do with faith at all? As Jesus steps into this, because, and I, I want to go from where this man says, he goes, as Jesus says, all things are possible for the one who believes, and this man says, I believe, but help me in my unbelief. What does that mean? I mean, think about it for a second. When Jesus says, all things are possible for the one who believes, there are countless things that we probably think of for that. And I first want to say what it's not. <laughs> What, 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 what is not meant by that? At first, it's not, a, it's not a quantity. Faith is not a quantity. It's not an amount. Jesus is not saying an amount. Look, oftentimes you will hear this in sporting events, right? It was even tweeted after uh, Nick Walenda walked across the Grand Canyon that when, when asked, they say, hey, we just, when we were down in the fourth quarter, we just believed. We believed that we would win it and, and we came back and won it. What, what does that mean? You believed what? <laughs> is, is faith an amount? Is it a quantity? Is it, is it you having enough to where it works? I remember when I was a little kid. I don't even think I was a Christian at the time. And I was praying to God to sh for Him to show Himself to me. And you know how I prayed? I'd go, God, I'm, I'm going to go to bed tonight. And if you put a piece of gold on, on my nightstand. Wh why gold? I love gold. I don't know why. You know, the gold on the nightstand. I've literally prayed this for like weeks. God, if you would put gold on the nightstand and I wake up in the morning and there's gold there, I, I will know that I'll have faith. I know, I'll know you're real. You're real. You know? And I would go to bed thinking, I'm, I'm believing there's going to be gold. I'm believe there's going to be gold. I mean, what? You know? I was a little kid, but I'm thinking, look, that's our default. Our cultural default is to think we need to have enough. We need to have an amount, a quantity. But Jesus is not saying that here. 
See, it's a, a lot of you may think that faith in God is having enough to get do- God to do what you want Him to do. That if you believe enough, if you pump enough spiritual quarters into God, He will answer your prayers and get you what you want. And the hardships that many of you are having aren't just because they're difficult and you're going through hard things, but you may be angry with God because He's not giving you something that you shouldn't have or don't need. Faith is not a quantity. And it's also not a quantity, but it's an amount. It's not a quality either. As if your faith needs to be, you need to purify yourself enough to have God do what you want to do. Look, when I was a youth minister in, in Texas, I had a, uh, I remember it being in, um, I was actually visiting Jackson, uh, Art Reformed Theological Seminary in Jackson. I got a phone, I, I looked at my phone and I had about 13 missed calls. And I listened to, you know, the first three out of how many messages. And I I had gotten the call that one of my high school students who had had leukemia had just died. And as fast as I could, I had to get some sort of flight out of Jackson, get home. And this girl was an amazing girl. And I heard through as she was struggling with you know, in her last weeks with leukemia that was just withering away her body. And she was spending time at home. And even, uh, even she was such an amazing girl, she called her own funeral a, he- a heaven send-off. That I heard that there were uh, certain people who had actually said to her at one point, if your faith was pure enough, you would be healed. I cannot tell you how angry that makes me. Because is the fact that the Lord allowed her to go to heaven early in her life, does that mean her faith is futile and her God is not powerful enough? Is that true? Let's look. Daniel 3. If you have a Bible, look in the Old Testament. Don't take my word for it. Let's look at Daniel 3. Daniel is... um, We're going to look at one of the most famous passages that even if you're here and you don't know your Bible, you may know of these three names. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Right? Daniel chapter 3. We're going to look at uh, only a couple verses here. Verses 15 to 18. Listen to this. Now, let me set the scene for you here. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are in, in the, this kingdom. And essentially, the king, Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, is saying, if you do not bow down and worship this God that I have set up, you will be punished. You will be cast into this fire. And this is a a nationwide deal. That all, even if you had whatever religions you had, you had to bow down to this. This is the Babylonian captivity. And listen to this dialogue that goes on between these three men and Nebuchadnezzar. Starting in verse 15 of Daniel 3. Now if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, to fall down and worship the image that I have made well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If it be now listen to this. This may actually, in some sense, be discomforting to you, but listen. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to de- is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, Be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Do you see what's different here? Do you see what is being said here in Daniel and in Mark? 
that faith is not about a quantity or amount or a quality. It is about a focus. It is about an object. It is about going... It is about something. It's pouring into something. It focuses away from self to something greater. I think what's so amazing about what is said here in Daniel is that they're saying to him, if God doesn't, if He chooses to not pull us out of this fiery furnace, and we don't have this incredible Sunday school story that we've heard all our lives, what if they burned up? Does that render God helpless? No! It changes nothing about who God is. And it changes nothing about our faith because our faith isn't in the circumstances of whether the fire is going to destroy us. It's in the personhood and love of the King who is over you. And you can do anything to us. And that will not change the fact that He is on the throne. Look, guys, this is what's really encouraging. If you're here tonight and you're struggling with what, what faith is, Faith is not you putting God on the throne. It's you recognizing that He is on the throne. Your faith does not put Him there, nor does it keep Him there. And that is a freedom that we have. Because if it was the other way around, and oftentimes it feels that way, that if we were to fall off that wire, would that render Him not God? Because if that was the case, then would He be God at all? Would He really be that powerful? Look, faith is like this. I was flying here, and I was sitting with two uh, students, actually about your age. It was really interesting. One was with his dad, and one was flying by himself. One uh, boy was flying by himself right behind me. And they were both uh, flying for the first time. And one of the boys behind me was, you could tell he was nervous. Like when he walked down the aisle, he was by himself. It was a little bit like, scoot in the seat. You know, I'm going to sit here. And the other boy was just kind of like, dude, this is awesome. His dad was like, yeah, you can get whatever you want. Get more peanuts, get more pretzel. I mean, he was just kind of like, this is sweet. This is the life, you know, like totally kicking it back, right? Now... Wait a minute. Does the fact that the boy behind me was really worried about the flight mean that I didn't get here? Does it mean that he didn't get here? Does the fact that the boy who was sitting with his dad kicking it back, having pretzels, enjoying his Coke, does that make any difference whether that plane landed in Panama City from Nashville, Tennessee? No. You see, it's not the amount because it's not the fact of whether one is nervous or one is not. The fact is that their faith was not in whether they could grip the seat tight enough to make the plane land or have enough peanuts or pretzels to make them throw up before they land. It was the fact that the plane got them there, not them, not their emotions, not their fears, not their being relaxed. Guys, that's faith. Some of you are in here and are shaking. Some of you are kind of like, I don't know if I have enough faith. Y'all, it's not the amount. It's the object. It's Look, faith, here's another illustration, is like a windshield, right? Right now in Nashville, it's awesome because there are lightning bugs everywhere. And my son is going out and he's just like, wow, wow. You know, he's grabbing. We're like, softer, son, softer. He's like, yeah. You know, like he's like, look at my hands glowing. Um, uh, <laughs> But I remember driving home and one went lick right on the windshield. And dude was having a ride. Like he turned the right way and was like glowing, literally putting his glowing rear in my face. And I was driving like, dude, like faith is like a windshield. Look, if I'm going to sit there and stare, you don't stare at a windshield, I'll have a wreck. Faith is the windshield through which you see what is coming up. Faith is what you see through to see the object of it. It drives you to Jesus. And here's what's amazing about this man. The focus of him when he says, I believe but help me in my unbelief. You know what he's actually saying? 
He's not saying, Jesus, can you give me a little bit of yours to make up for it? He's actually saying to Jesus, I need you to be my faith. That's actually the language. What's interesting is when there, there's a lot of discussion about what is being said when Jesus says, all things are possible for one who believes. Why would the guy right after say, I believe but help me in my unbelief? It's to say that there's only been one person who has had perfect faith. One person who looked to his heavenly Father. And that's Jesus. But you know what's incredible about it? Is that even Jesus Himself going to the cross, in the Garden of Gethsemane, when He was face to face with the fact that He was going to the cross, God, He said to His Father, God, if there is any other way, if there is any other way to save these people by not having to go to that cross, is it possible? And what was said to Him? No. And Jesus said, Not my will, but thy will be done. Do you think Jesus... You know why He went through that? Because for us to understand how our doubts are met with true faith, we have to have a Savior who has encountered the same doubts that you have, the same doubts that I have, the fear of, is, are these talks going to be good this week? Are you going to enjoy the beach this week? Are you going to have good friendships? Is God real? Am I really forgiven? Is that a reality? All these doubts and questions, Jesus had to experience and feel and encounter the doubt, and yet still believe so that we can. That's the only way that we can get faith and grow in it is because we look to the author and perfecter of our faith. That's what Hebrews says. We just sang a song earlier from Hebrews. It says the author and perfecter of our faith. We look to Him to change us. We look through that windshield. It's not your amount. It's not how great you are. It's not your ability. It's your humility by looking away from you to the One who has done it. The focus on Jesus, who is the only one who is focused on His Father, purely, so that we can get faith and grow in it. And you know what's beautiful about that? It has to be apart from us, because if it changed anything about it, if Jesus in any way swayed, then what's beautiful about this week is we're going to be talking about what's it like to fall off that tightrope in every way. About the Bible, about suffering. But if God is who He says He is, we can fall and get right back up. Because it's not the amount of us getting up, it's who He is. With that, let's pray. <coughs> Heavenly Father, thank You for the author and our perfecter of our faith. Lord, uh, we're going to talk more about that this week. God, I pray that even tonight this would unpack a little bit of the doubts that we have. The questions that we bring in this room that we don't know if, if you really are who you say you are. And yet, Jesus, you show us here that as this man beautifully put, help me in my unbelief, you didn't complete his faith, you are his faith. You are the one who didn't just heal this boy, but you saved him. You are the Savior. And I pray for these students in here this week. I pray that you, they would bring their doubts and questions to you. And that they would not just look at their own belief, but they would look beyond themselves to the one who had perfect faith. So that we might believe. And have the freedom to say, God, I believe, but help me in my unbelief. I beg this of you in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.